Do you need me to work the camera? No, that's fine. Okay. I don't move around. All right. Uh, for the rest of us, okay. Uh, just to review, open to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1. We started the subject of dispensations. Dispensations. That's kind of a big word. And all it means, we learned last week, uh, it's from the Greek word koinomia, which is a compound word. It just means like a management or a stewardship. And it's looking basically at the breakdown of how God worked in different times um, throughout the scripture as far as the human history. And so we have seven different particular ones. Some would argue that there's an eighth, which would be, if you wanted to put that, uh, it begin basically Revelation 22 after old heaven and old earth are passed, after they're destroyed in a great fervent heat, and then you would have the creation of new heaven, new earth. Uh, judgment's already been done with, over and done with at that point, and that would be where you have uh, the great and small that were brought before God at the great white throne, and then they were cast into the lake of fire, and then you had death and hell and the devil and all the demons, and everybody's cast into the lake of fire to burn for eternity, destruction of everything that was before, and then you have creation, you have a new earth, the new Jerusalem, new Jerusalem comes down, sits, and then from that point forward is eternity to be with the Lord uh, in new Jerusalem, new heaven, new earth. So that would be technically, if you want to consider an eighth dispensation, that would be it. Um, and then even some people kind of micro dissect beyond what's that. But the seven main ones we saw were you have the period of where God dealt with man in innocence. So this would be in the garden before Adam fell, before he chose to sin against God. And he had given them a command in particular don't eat of the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil. And then, because in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And then he goes after however long a period of time where he's walking with God. Uh, you have Satan come tempt Eve, deceives her, and then Adam, who is with her at that time, chooses to eat of the fruit. He was not deceived according to 1 Timothy, but he chose to go ahead and sin against God regardless because of his wife. And so... Uh, they fall, then you have curse that is brought to them as a result, but God gives promise uh, in Genesis 3.15 that he would have uh, the seed of the woman uh, is going to bruise the head of the serpent. And so we have supernatural, um, we have a prophecy of someone that is going to be supernatural because women, women don't have seed. Okay, men have seed. Uh, women, women carry eggs. And so this is speaking of going to be the Messiah that is to come. And you get more prophecy later on down in Scripture that elaborates on the fact of who this Messiah would be, this promised one that is going to basically bruise the head of the serpent in order to destroy Satan's authority, Satan's power. Um, so then at that point now, he starts dealing with them on the basis of conscience. So now they have a knowledge of what is right and wrong, what is good and evil, um, from meaning of the knowledge of, uh, from meaning of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they still go ahead and they sin. So it doesn't restrict them from sinning or from carrying on in their own uh, selfish ways or in their sin. So God at that point, fast forward however many hundreds of thousands of years to where God destroys the world with a flood save for eight people. So you got eight people that are rescued from being destroyed uh, from the entire face of the planet. So you have, who knows how many people were on planet Earth considering the fact that they had lifespans of over 900 years. Um, and you could have however many kids within that amount of time. And even the ones that, you know, they lived that long. So he destroys the whole earth, uh, everybody on it, with the exception of those eight people. Once they are out, and then uh, Noah offers sacrifice unto God, he uh, is then given command by God. He's given a promise, he's given a covenant, which is what the rainbow is to demonstrate I'm not going to destroy the world by means of flood again. Uh, but he tells him that uh, in Genesis 9 in particular that if man sheds man's blood then that, uh, that man's blood shall be shed. Uh, so at that point he starts instituting 
what would be considered human government. Okay, that's the start of human government at that point. Uh, in other words, he was given authority to be able to go ahead and take life for life being taken. And verse 6, it says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Uh, if you wanted to go further, uh, it says every... And God, you know, at the beginning of verse 1, it says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Because there's nobody else around right now. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, and into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing uh, that liveth shall be meat for you, even as a green herb have I given you all things. Okay, so now we'll be able to eat stuff other than just... Um, just veggies, but fruit. Uh, but the flesh with the life thereof, uh, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood, uh, surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require, and at the hand of man. And at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. And who's the shed of man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed for the image of God made he man. Now he wasn't dealing with them on that basis prior to him destroying the earth with the flood. But, so now he instituted a different way in which he's going to be interacting with humankind, and that's by human government. The reason why we say human government is because he didn't really have man having authority over other men in that regard before. Now he gives authority to man to be able to discern, okay, what would be uh, something that would be worthy of taking a man's life uh, and as far as being able to execute judgment, righteous judgment. All right, so now you can kill people uh, righteously. And what I mean by that is not you go on murder, but in other words, somebody murders somebody, uh, which is premeditated. Uh, man is actually now given authority by God to be able to go ahead and execute the murderer. Uh, now, we, we know in the law he gives more provision for that with regard to if it's what would be considered manslaughter if it's something that would be accidental. He goes on to more, and I'll elaborate on that, but God's plan was that we don't kill each other. Okay, God doesn't like violence. He actually destroyed the earth because of that. Uh, he talks about in Genesis 6. He saw that the earth was filled with violence and that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth and that uh, the thought of man was only evil continually. Uh, and so he sought to destroy everybody because of that. Um, within this time frame of when he's dealing with man and human government, he's part he particularly isolates one gentleman out of Ur of the Chaldees, uh, which was Abraham, uh, which is where we're going to be at today. Um, in Ephesians, the reason why I had you guys turn there, in Ephesians 1, um, Starting at, well, you, you, you can read the whole thing, but you, we'll start at verse 9. Okay, heaven made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he had purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him. Okay, so he speaks of there being a dispensation of the fullness of times. Okay, so there's a stewardship, there's a set aside time that he deals with man that's called the dispensation of the fullness of times or the stewardship of the fullness of times. So he's giving division here of how he interacts with man. Um, we won't look at this today, but we will, there's, there's an argument going on as far as um, the Christians or so-called theologians that say dispensations are only really recent uh, since basically the 1800s by a gentleman by the name of J. And Darby uh, would have been the first, uh, I guess you could say, evangelical writer or Christian quote, quote unquote theologian that would have brought about the concept of dispensations. And that prior to him bringing it into, uh, I guess, existence or whatnot, that it wouldn't have been known. Um, but you can see that Apostle Paul writes here that there's a dispensation of the fullness of times. It's not the only place in which he writes of there being a dispensation. Uh, but as far as with regard to the concept of 
God having different sets of ages as far as how he dealt with man differently. Um, not that salvation was different in the different times. It simply was always by faith um, in Christ. At that time prior to him coming, it was always looking forward to Christ. Now us in this time and age is us looking backwards to what Christ has already done. Um, but so it was still... Uh, no, it's just he brought it back around, I guess, to awareness. Um, the argument that people make against him or against the fact that dispensation is being taught to begin with is because of basically um, Calvinism or covenant theology. And we'll get into that at the end, not of this lesson, but at the end, towards the end of the series, as far as the errors. The reason why that's the case, just as a preview, is because covenant theology seeks it's also kind of known as replacement theology. What they look at is they look at the covenants that God had with man, and they use the argument primarily from Galatians, uh, but in other places, but primarily from Galatians as far as the church. And also, I think you can, uh, from in Revelation, where it talks about uh, that there's the synagogue of the Jews, which say they are, but they're not. Uh, so they're the synagogue of Satan, in other words. And then they look to see that since we are adopted, we're grafted in, that and God had set aside Israel, that the church basically replaces Israel, and that the promises and the covenants that God had made towards Israel really are not going to be towards us, and that are fulfilled in us. So they just basically discount anything that has to do with Israel as a people and as a nation, uh, which some of the covenants, some of the promises are yet to be fulfilled, and we look forward to that, and that's going to be in the millennium. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they discount that, they do away with that, and so they attack dispensational theology, uh, and they kind of modify it some. Anyways, the, the, we'll, we'll get into that at a later lesson. That's a whole other lesson. Um, so we looked at, he addresses the fact that there's this dispensation of the fullness of time. So we see that, okay, there's dispensations as far as not just mention the word itself, but the concept as far as their God dealing with man different ways. Uh, again, you ask, okay, what's the point of this? Uh, if you just took the Bible and read it, you could actually just see this or figure this out. You might not know the term, or, but the concept, the root concept as far as that God deals with man uh, in certain ways. And he dealt with man uh, in different ways, though not necessarily for salvation. What I mean by that is, uh, he dealt with man on the on the basis of his innocence uh, in the garden. Once man fell, he dealt with them on the basis of his conscience. Uh, after the world was destroyed, except for eight people, you have God instituting human government, and he's dealing with the, with mankind on the basis of human government. Uh, he is going to in that period of time with human government uh, going to deal with him in particular uh, as far as he's we're going to look at today is he calls Abraham go to Genesis chapter 12 Genesis chapter 12 actually go to Genesis chapter 10 I'm sorry go to Genesis chapter 10 <coughs> Or, or, I'm sorry, 11. 11 is what I meant, not 10, 11. 11. Just a page over. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Okay, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Uh, if we were to go back to Genesis chapter 9, okay, it, verses 28 and 29, the end of the chapter, it says that Noah lived. After the flood, 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. And then you're going to have chapter 10, which is a really long genealogy. Uh, and it ends, chapter 10, verse 32, that these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations uh, in the nations, in their nations, and by these nations, 
uh, divided in the earth after the flood. Okay, so now you have people being divided up according to family groups, um, basically based off Noah's three sons and their families. So that leads us into chapter 11, which tells us that the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. So I have however many people, hundreds or hundreds of thousands of people that are alive at this point because they've been living. Um, Noah lived up 950 years. Okay, so they still have really long lifespans. Even though the earth was altered um, and the atmosphere was changed and altered because of the flood, uh, they still had pretty long life at this point. So you have multiple people that are being born to this three children, and then they have multiple people that are being born and so now you have, they're, they're fulfilling God's command to them as far as be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. So in other words, God wanted them to be able to go ahead and have lots and lots and lots of kids and to populate the planet. Um, but this is interesting. It says of uh, the whole earth, they were of one language and of one speech. So, okay, there wasn't any division in how they communicated. That would have been the same thing prior to the flood because there's no indication that they would have had any kind of differences in languages or cultures or anything like that, really, from before they were all destroyed in the flood, before the whole planet was destroyed. So you figure, okay, you have however many people, say maybe, you, let's say we had even 7.2 billion people back then. 7.2 billion, they all spoke the same language, basically had roughly the same culture, because okay, they, they would have come from the same people, from Adam and Eve, all right, as did Noah and his wife and his three sons. But they're all communicating the same language, same culture. Here's what it says in verse 2. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, speaking of the folks that are on planet Earth. And they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime, had they for mortar. And they said, Let us go. Uh, they said, Go to, let us build a city. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, uh, lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. That's interesting, okay? God's command to them was to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. God's actual design and desire for them was that they would spread out. Now, they didn't want to spread out. They wanted to go ahead and remain in one area, uh, and they didn't want to be scattered. Okay, they didn't want to go ahead and go out and be scattered. So they wanted to stay in one area and they wanted to make a name for themselves. Okay, so they wanted to promote themselves. Now, here's what some people argue as far as like, okay, you have the city and the tower which may reach unto heaven. Question. What is that? What is the tower? Yeah. What is in a city that reaches unto heaven? There's other there's there's archaeological finds of what's some of ancient some of the cigarettes, the kind of pure, pyramid type thing. Sort of has to do with their religion. I don't know if they've actually found this particular one, but what is the question? Okay, I'm sorry. What is the tower? Yeah, what is what is the tower? What's he talking about when he says, Okay, let us build us a tower? Oh, a tower. Yeah, okay. a tower in a city. Is man reaching to God through the Trying to, man trying to get to heaven or reach out to God somehow through other than Christ. Are they trying to are they trying to build a skyscraper that goes into like space? Mm -hmm. Not really. I don't okay. Know, I don't know. No, I'm just saying because some people are, some people think that, and that if you were to just read it just a, whatever, it's like okay, oh that's cool. They're trying to build a skyscraper that goes into space, the tallest skyscraper, you know. They didn't have the technology. <laughs> we don't know that they might have. I actually don't know what the kind of technology they would have had. Back steel then. beams and columns. <laughs> well, a lot of times ta towers were for like protection, to do stuff to the armies. But since they're all one speech and they're all one together, that can't be what it was. So, I've been told they want to see how far if they could go up to be with God, or how far they could get up to God. Uh, that's more or less like I, if, okay, when you have cities and there's a lot of people in cities, then crime develops. Where in the country, you really don't have that much because people are 
are associated with each other, but they're away from each other. So they start thinking differently when they're in a big group in a, like a city. Um, he tells them, he, they basically give away kind of what their motive here was. He says, uh, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And, but they said, let us make a name, let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. Okay, so basically what they wanted was they wanted to exalt themselves as, look at us, we're somebody. Right? They wanted to make a name for themselves. They were wanting to take away glory and attention from who God really is to who they are. They wanted, they wanted to exalt themselves. They wanted to be, I guess, you could, it's pride. It's like a saint that they wanted to be like the Most High. I will be like the Most High. I will exalt my, you know, uh, my throne above the stars. I will exalt um, the, the seven, uh, five things that he had stated in, in Ezekiel. As far as that he would, that he would this, that he would that, that he wanted to. Yes? Well, it's kind of like today. Um, people are saying, you know, God is a old fashioned concept and stuff because of all, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about space, uh, about, uh, what does it say about space? It doesn't say anything about uh, other civilizations, you know, other places. And, uh, but the Bible just doesn't say on those things. True. He um. Here's here's what. Well, let's let's look at what God did, and then He says, "Okay." Um. In verse five, it says, "And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower uh, which the children of men builded, and the Lord said, Behold, the people was one, and they all and." They have all one language. And this they begin to do, talking about that they're building that tower and that they want to make a name for themselves and they don't want to be scattered. Okay. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Okay, interesting that he arrives at that conclusion. Okay. You have free communication among everybody and anything that they would imagine to do, they'll be able to do. Why? Well, because they've been given ability, but they're misusing the abilities they've been given and gifted by God to go ahead and work against Him. And they don't really have, they have cooperation one with another rather than division. Um, and then so, this is God's plan for them. He says, go to, let us go down and, let us go down and there confound their language. Confound, literally confuse that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Okay, therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did all confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And then he's going to go into genealogies. Um, here's another instance of where God starts dealing with man in a different different way. Now mind you, salvation is still going to be the same because he still is having given them the promise of the fact that, okay, there's going to be someone that is going to be supernatural coming. This person is going to smash the head of the serpent. Okay, he's going to bruise the head of the serpent. Now the bruise, the serpent's going to bruise the heel of this individual, but the serpent's head is going to be um, basically destroyed, bruised, and then it's not only going to be um, someone that does that, but it's going to be of a seed of a woman. So he's going, to, he's going to be of supernatural origin. Okay, so he's going to be from a woman. He's going to have human. Uh, but the thing is, he's going to be from rather than, in other words, the, the, the man is the one that carries seed, but it, the seed is from a woman. So it's, it's something unique or different that God's going to do. And this, they're still looking forward to this. So now man, because they want to rebel, they want to be rebels, he's dealing with him on the, on the, on the issue of Still, with human government, he hasn't elaborated. He just adds something different as far as how now he wanted for them. And that is, he confounds their ability to be able to understand and communicate with one another. Because God desired that we don't... All right. 
this is going to sound really bad. All right, this is going to sound this is going to sound really bad. All right. <laughs> and, um, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm uh, okay. I don't, I don't mean this to sound racist or anything like that, but the differences that we have, okay, that's by design, by God's plan, okay. Uh, because otherwise, left to ourselves, outside of Christ, we would all be rebels against God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. The world, right now this is a big thing in media, and it's promoted. And, I mean, if you have any kind of common sense, you would see, but, like, it's the media trying to stir the pot. Stir the pot. But the thing is, it's still something that would, it's been commonplace all along. Um, people look down on each other regardless, you know, of whatever difference that you might have. So if everybody had the same skin color, people would still be looking down on each other. They would find something as far as to go ahead and look down on, on another person and try and enslave that other person. Uh, you know, you have not only just differences with, uh, here, with differences with language, but also in cultural upbringing and those kinds of things. Um, but the thing is, if you're, as a, as a Christian, in Christ-like mentality is like, okay, we're, we're one, we're, we're family, we're brethren, and it's because of the blood of Christ. Okay, what the world does is they try to imitate that, uh, but it, they don't have Jesus, and so they don't have a motivating factor of love, but rather it's of it's of control. And what they would want to do is they would want to take everybody to be able to manipulate them, to control them, to be able to get what they can from them, and if they would work together, uh, and then they can just do away with basically God if they could, so that they could be free to live according to the pleasure of their flesh. Right? That's what the world wants. And if you, there's some well-meaning people and well-hearted people that are confused. And what I mean by that is there, you have certain, certain people, I guess, on the left agenda, that are somewhat accurate in some of what they would say as far as unity, but they have a wrong basis, and that would be they look at it, unity as far as on the basis of um, humanity rather than, than Christ-likeness. And then um, what you would have then at that point is if everybody got along together and everybody was okay, well-meaning and that kind of stuff, it wouldn't matter anyways because if you died and went to hell, then, you know, it'd be kind of pointless. They want to have all the things that you have as a believer without being a believer. Yes. In effect, yes. And so, um, why I say that is because, okay, the, the divisions and all that are in somewhat necessary for the sake of not being destroyed or killed off by God. Okay? Uh, and that's not me trying to promote violence or discrimination or anything like that, but just simply that's just a natural fact. That's something that you got to like, wait a minute, God wanted there to be a division. Uh, not, he wanted it so that we would, because man left himself, man governing himself, and man left to his own a quarter of uh, resources is going to fight God. Okay? And it, yes? I think we need to be careful today. Uh, <clears throat> Because we're bombarded on all the media uh, about the world's way, about lifting up uh, mankind. You know, that man is smarter than God, the scientists know more than God. And uh, we as Christians can find ourselves caught up in uh, their ways. If we're not very careful, we need to really uh, let God lead us instead of following the world's ideas. Sure. And the world's ideas are basically selfishness. That's true. That's the root of it. They're going to want to promote self. And self was always going to want to lift its, lift up against God and rebel against God. And it doesn't want to acknowledge that, hey, God is greater. God's in control. God's master. And I owe everything to him. And I am supposed to yield to him. Uh, so here we have God instituting division. Now, he's still governing, or he's still giving man, as far as authority, to be able to go ahead and govern themselves. Go to chapter 12, and then he's going to start dealing, in particular, with a man called Abram. 
on. He's going to call Abram, and then from here forward, you're going to start a few other divisions that he has. Uh, 12.1, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All right, so then it says of Abram, it says, So Abram departed as he, uh, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and, the, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And then he talks about he, he took his wife and uh, all his substance. But this is something that's unique. We see God dealing with mankind. We, we know he dealt with no one in particular, and we saw that if we were to look back earlier parts of Genesis, that he dealt, he dealt with uh, Enoch. Enoch walked with God, and you know, he took him because he was not. Um, we also see that he, there was others that were faithful to God. There was Seth, and then his line, his lineage of those that believed God and that were faithful to him. But now we have God seeking out somebody in particular, and he's going to isolate how he's going to deal with mankind. He's still dealing with them overall in general uh, on the fact that they're to govern themselves. So he, he let them to go govern themselves. But now he gives this gentleman, Abram, a promise. He give, he, he's going to establish a covenant with him, but he makes a promise to him, and he says to him in particular, you know, get out from where you're at, go to a land that I'm going to show you. He didn't tell him where yet. And that he's going to make of him a, uh, a great name and a great nation. And he's going to be a blessing. And Abram himself is going to be a great blessing. He's going to make his, well, we'll see later, he's going to elaborate on his promise to him that uh, his seed is going to be as the sand of the seashore. Uh, that's in Genesis 15. But here in particular, he says that uh, um, he's going to bless those that bless him and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So in other words, you're going to have something that is unique happen that the whole planet and everyone on the planet is going to look to you and they're going to be blessed because of, because of you. And we know later on that that is going to be the fact that Messiah is going to come through his lineage and that he's going to set it. He, he picked him up specifically. Um, to bring Messiah through his, through his line, through his lineage, through his offspring. But now he sets aside, and then this is what we would consider promise, but still this lies within uh, the realm of human government. And so now he's dealing with mankind, but he's dealing with mankind. Uh, they still have the ability to be able to go ahead and kill, and so now they're governing themselves uh, on the basis of, okay, you're not going to kill, and then other certain things that he would elaborate with Moses when he gives the law. So the laws that he gives Moses, he gives in particular uh, to not just Moses, but also all this that would be his offspring and all the ones that would have been uh, previous to him. And so he's, he's going to establish of them. Uh, he's going to make the nation of Israel. And so he deals in particular, here's the, here's the birth, I guess you could say, of the nation of Israel, uh, the root of it nation of Israel. So you start dealing with mankind on this basis. Question. Is this reading into scripture? Uh, all right, here's what I mean by that. Okay. These are plain, kind of easy to see things as far as that God is doing. Right? You're just reading along Boom. You see, okay, wait a minute, God's dealing with mankind on a different basis now. It's still the fact that he gave promise that there's going to be somebody that's coming that's supernatural. And now he elaborates on the fact that this person that's supernatural, um, he says it's going to be through Abram. He's, he sets aside Abram, and in particular he says, look, you're going to be a blessing to all families on the earth. You know, I'm going to make of you a great nation. So he starts isolating as far as who he's going to deal with now. 
even though he still has a heart for everybody. And he, he explains that later on in Scripture. But, is that not like pretty plain to see? Alright, now here's why I asked that question. It's kind of silly, but the fact is, Jay and Darby in 1870-something, whenever he would start writing about this, like, wouldn't have been the first guy to see this. <laughs> In other words, it didn't start with him. This is just somebody that was reading scripture and decided, okay, hey, to write. And didn't want to just go ahead and twist scripture like uh, Augustine and uh, Origen and all these other guys that want to go ahead and, and, and take scripture as, yes? Can you turn your volume up a little bit? I'm okay. Understanding. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me, um, let, me, let me speak a little bit louder. I'm sorry. So, what we're seeing here is God's dealing with man, and he's dealing with man in different ways, but yet he still has the same promise that he's given to them. All right? He hasn't changed the fact that if, if you go, well, if you go to Genesis 15, go to Genesis 15 real quick. Uh, it says, okay, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Okay, and Abraham said, Lord, God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold to thee, or excuse me, behold to me, thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shalt thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Okay? Now, how far removed was he from the law at this point? From what? From the law, like 420 years or something like that. At least, probably a little bit more than that. Uh, probably, I'd say I don't know, maybe 450, 460. Who knows? I, I, well, I should, I should have done the math. Um, so he's he's pretty far removed from where the law was given, but it's told here he counted it to him for righteousness. He believed God and he counted it to him for righteousness. If you go to Genesis six. Whenever Noah uh, was on earth and God decided to go ahead and destroy the earth, he said, I will destroy man from the face of the earth. And then it goes and it tells you that, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, so Noah found grace. Um, Enoch, if you want to go even further back than that, Enoch. It says not only that he walked with God, but in particular says that uh, after his son uh, Methuselah was born dead. He began to seek the Lord, and others, he's, and men began to seek the Lord. But he also, he, he started walking with God at that point. Uh, whether that meant that he was born again at that point, or that was where he took his Christian walk seriously, uh, the fact is, in every age or in every section of where we see that God is dealing with man, that might change or be different. The way of salvation has always been the same, and it's by faith, okay? So in other words, it's always been by faith, it's always going to be by faith, and it's by the grace of God, uh, by grace through faith, as it talks about in Ephesians. Uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we see that in every instance, in every age, in every section that we would see as far as God interacting with man. That's always been the same. That's never changed. Uh, at this point, they're still looking forward to God's promise. Uh, he's looking forward to the fact that, okay, God's given him a promise that he's going to have a seed. His seed is going to, he's just been told, it's going to be as the sand of the sea, that all the fir families of the earth are going to be blessed by him and by his seed. Uh, and then also, there's a seed that's coming also that is going to crush or bruise the head of the serpent. That is going to be of a woman. 
we're going to see later on that he gives more detail about what the seed is like, uh, in particular to Moses, that it's going to be, the seed is going to be as a prophet, like unto a prophet, and also he's going to be a lawgiver. He's going to come from the line of Judah in particular after we get more of the families to be elaborated. All right, so uh, we'll continue looking into this, and we'll see about the giving of the law, and then from the law to where we would find ourselves in this day and age, which is the church age. Okay, uh, In the chart that is given, where it says grace, which is number six, right after law, I would erase, or not erase, but I would put a line through it where it says grace. The reason why is because grace is given in every age. Grace was available in every age. It wasn't just strictly limited to just where we're at right now in the church age. And I would just put church. Um, that's just the chart that I found that best explained it, that, that, um, that put it like that. That whatever. A lot of people like to call it that uh, because of the argument put forth in, in uh, Galatians about the, the law and grace. But the fact is, grace was available in every age. We saw that Noah found it. We saw that Enoch found it. We saw even that uh, God was gracious to Adam and Eve after their sin uh, and providing provision. Yes? I think uh, it's very important for us to really know uh, the Old Testament. Uh, as I, I get older, I learn more and more. We learn from history. And people go off on their own ideas. And they're not new ideas, really. If you go back in history, you know, you can see the results of their going into error and their civilizations breaking down their morals. But if we know our Bible, you know, there we can give illustrations of what uh, the Bible, God uses illustrations of Israel, what they did, and the people, and their, when they go off on their own ideas, their own selfishness, uh, God has to judge them. And that's true for Christians as well as uh, believers, for unbelievers. It's true. That's a really good point. It's a really good point. Okay, uh, one, does anybody have any questions? All right. Okay, so next week we're going to be continuing looking. We're going to look at how when the law was given, in particular, that would be in Exodus, to Moses. Uh, we'll look at also just the promises that were elaborated upon as far as the seed and then also Messiah and then from there hopefully we'll be getting into what would be the church age. Then after that the others following that would be tribulation and then the kingdom. Uh, kingdom being millennial kingdom. Alright so no more questions we're dismissing.